The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Stephen Smoogin, if you're here for the Jay Ruby talk that's on in the blue book, it's not here. Oh, it's the other guy. Um, the fellow who was doing the Jay Ruby talk, I better not stand in front of the slideshow, has, was not able to make it, so I'm filling in for him. Goodbye. <laughs> um, my name is Steve Smoogin. I'm a recovering system administrator. I know I'm only supposed to use my first name, but, uh, well, you all have already downloaded everything you need to know about me just to make sure I'm legitimate. Uh, I'm here to fill this hour with advice and knowledge from my 25 years of system administration. Uh, the following contains truths, half-truths, outright lies, and maybe a little bit of something that helps you along in the way. Um, currently, I have worked, well, I have worked for the government, I've worked for educational institutions, I've kind of worked for the military, I've worked for Red Hat Software for four years, and then I took a long break, and I started up with Red Hat again on the Fedora project about two or three years ago. Um, I worked on CentOS 5, and have done little things here and there all through that time. Um, most of that time I have been a system administrator. Um, my job here today, other than to fill this hour, is to help train you guys on, or help, help you find ways that you can train your users to be better things. Uh, why do we need this training in here? Because frankly, most of us never woke up and wanted to be a sysadmin. We started off as secretaries, physicists, maybe even the piano player, but fell into this life of degrading crime. You may have started off with, you know, you fixed a jammed printer. You found the boss's any key. Or, like myself, you just walked in the wrong door at the wrong time, and they said, you're, can you fix that? Okay. Anyway, you end up as a system administrator. It always starts off small. You know, you fix the jam printer. Then somebody asks you, can you make it print two copies? And soon, well, you have to fix the toner problem. And eventually, you've, somebody says, we're using too much toner. You start on it, and you start on it, and you finally have changed the whole print queue so that instead of printing at your printer, you print at the printer across the street because, well, it's not your toner anymore. <laughs> and Bob, who asked you to do this, he needs to walk anyway. He's eating all your donuts. It's a bad life. And at that moment, you've made the step. You have started training your user. A, not to ask you questions. And B, how to get things done. Sure, Bob needs to lose that 10 pounds he's gained from the Krispy Kremes, but doesn't stop him from eating more donuts when he comes back and asking you more questions. And while we would love to use the clue by four, 
frankly, we're all a little too pretty for prison. So, what is a modern sysadmin supposed to do? You could take CSI courses, but all you really learn is quick lime doesn't work as well as they say in the movies. And so there has to be a better answer. And I'm here to try and help you with that answer. One that I've cribbed from my many courses in my failed attempt to get a psychology degree. Skinner tests, or as they call it now, advanced behavior, sorry, applied behavior analysis, uh, or ABA. It is basically the standard thing of a Skinner test uh, Dr. B.F. Skinner is credited, so there's many other scientists involved, but he's credited with it. You, you take a lever, you put a rat, and if the rat hits the lever, he gets a shot of heroin. And then you see how many times he'll hit the ha hammer to get another shot. And eventually you train, train him to go buy the crack, bring it in, process it for you, and uh, move on. Now, all this may sound familiar to anyone who's ever had to train a dog, but let's face it, you, dogs are easier to train than users. But the, the concept's the same. You take a task, you break it into individual parts. Say, we're dealing with a printer problem that we always have to deal with if we're, you show them how to pull out the tray. You show them how to flick the paper so it doesn't build up static electricity. You put the tray back in. You step it all through. And if they do it right, you give them a reward. If they do it wrong, now, frankly, the old school where I came from, you hit them with a taser. But it doesn't work. Um, tasers do not, as much as they show in the guides and movies, the guy gets back up right afterwards and now you have to deal with a pissed off user who's full of adrenaline. It doesn't go very pretty from there. Instead, you need to neutrally let them know that they did it wrong and step them through it again. So how do you figure out what is a behavior that you're trying to change? Because it's all a behavior of whether it's asking, them, asking you questions at 2 o'clock in the morning or how to fill up the printer because it, no one else knows how to do it or that they're sending emails to themselves that they're backing up all their laptops using email of their email to themselves that they're going to back up their laptops. And then they wonder why email's not working. Well, again, it comes down to simplify, break the tasks up, train them slowly. It takes a long time to do this. You can't do this one at a time or expect a magic bullet in the next day. First, we have, need to observe and record the current behaviors the users have. A behavior is usually defined as something a living being does to a stimulus, a taser, a two by four, a clicking thing that says, click me now, click me now, on their page. Generally, if a dead person does it, it isn't a behavior. That is the standard psychology test for this. Um, my lawyers have asked me not to, to make sure that you know that this is not a license for you to find out what dead people do. They don't, we are only allowed to say that this is a rhetorical point with the expectation that you don't do anything beyond bloat and rot, end quote. Um, second, we take behaviors and label which ones we wish to keep and which ones we wish to remove. 
are alerting us to, ch to strange behavior of the computer, keep. Not clicking on organ enlargement ads, keep. Paging us at 2 a.m. because the printer is saying blinky light, blinky light, and they don't know what to do, don't keep. Third, we need to observe the behaviors and figure out the stimuli or tasks that prompt them. Break these tasks down into their atomic components. The reason for doing this is that most of us, most of these tasks we think are simple, are in fact confusingly obtuse to most people. We either have looked all overlooked those obtusenets, or we've forgotten it through all the beer we drank after we fixed the problem. Take filling a printer with paper. Depending on the printer, it can take eight to 20 individual t items to get the paper to properly work in a printer. Most people don't realize that. In fact, we don't realize it when we do this. We just do this, we finish, we're done. For the standard user, they look at it and all they see is a painful set of tasks ahead of them, full of punishments. Now, it's usually us punishing them, but we're trying to find a better way. I, again, my lawyers have asked me to keep your hobbies at home and we will just stick with nice, neutral ways of fixing our user problems. Now we need to train per component. This is not a simple thing. It may require multiple times to train your user. Open the tray, close the tray. Open the tray, close the tray. I have actually had a user put the tray in backwards. It took them a hammer to do so, but they did so. Honestly, it was, they went, couldn't get it in there, uh, and thought they were doing it wrong, so they kept pushing it. Um, as we walk through these things, you need to find a reward system for your user. I find M&Ms work really well. You toss them an M&M right afterwards, or you give them a reward like you find some toys, a geek geek toy, if they're geeky. You give them two minutes with it. They learn the task, you take the toy away. They, you move them to the next task. If you're, depending on other users, you can go to dollar store and buy a bag of little cowboys and Indians and stack them up on your desk. And when, they, when you're done playing with them, uh, you can then use them as rewards to the other users. Um, Again, if we miss a step when they're doing it, when you're like loading, okay, we've put the paper in, but they forgot to spray the paper so that it doesn't stick, we do not yell at them. It's hard, but we have to be nice and neutral with them. Think of them as a chihuahua with less brains. It helps. But we do not, again, we, you must... The reason we do this, we want to say it in a neutral tone, is that you eventually, you're building up a, a, their ability to seek out pain. It happens that the only, if the only interaction they're getting with you is you yelling at them, they will begin to seek it out. So we need to stay away from that. Let's go to a nice neutral area. You need to record the progress that you're doing with your users. You have a little three by five card or something, keep it straight. The reason being is that if they go too quickly, you've known you've broken it down to, you've got a good color group and you've broken it down too far and you can combine things up. If they're not progressing at all, they may never progress in this task, at which point you'll need to work around it and keep them away from the bright shiny toy. Uh, or they will try to fix the printer by themselves and then want to know why all the black stuff is all in their face and hands and on the floor and on the walls and in the cubicle. And on your door and your cubicles, they go, what's going on? Um, 
We come now to the next step, which is after you've gotten them training on here, they will come to expect the rewards, which can be pray, the M&Ms or the toys that you want to keep to yourselves as much as possible, but you need to share. And you need to back off the reward system. Basically, at a certain point, we need to go and tell them, good job, good going, keep it up. You need to mix it up a bit also because they become, if you keep giving them an M&Ms, they will just not listen to it anymore. Uh, actually, praise is very good. It's especially good if you record it. Because later during your review with your boss, you can play the praise to show that you actually treat your users well. Um, it also can re be useful later in a court. Okay, now we're down to, you've got, we've got behaviors that we want them to learn, and now we're wanting to get rid of behaviors. It's very similar. There are multiple methods for doing this. The hardest method is actually the most effective, like most things. It is called extinguishing. Again, we keep our, we're keep we not trying to kill anybody here, but it means more on the lines of ignoring the bad behavior. The user comes in, yells at you, you ignore them. You, you, or you redirect them and say, in a very nice, calm tone, I didn't understand that. Could you try that again? It resets them because they're expecting you to yell back. It's their game. They, they've, just, they've learned this little game. They like to hop around and yell at you and then expect you to yell back at them because it's what they expect from a sysadmin. Now, this works for most users. There are prima donnas out there who are, have never gotten past the two-year-old stage. They're usually considered valued employees. Um, you need to accept that and move on and not go get carpet pieces and uh, used cars that you can dump in a lake. It doesn't work. They catch on to you eventually. But users, the prima donna users, you need extinguishing works really well because a lot of them are expecting this whole game. They've come to it since they've been eight or nine. That if they yell and scream and lay on the floor and bang up their legs and down, they'll get what they want from a sysadmin. Again, neutral, quiet tones. Keep it nice and clear. And eventually, most of them will say, well, I know this game's not going to work with you anymore. I'll, I'll talk to you like a normal person. And you'll find out that they may become your best friend and do fix bugs for you in software that they're supposed to be writing. Um, or they'll go find another company where they can get away with it. It works both ways. You win either way. Um, to get a... To get ahead here, we need to steadily ignore the behavior. I've already said that. Um, or you can use a, if you're going to use a punishment method to redirect the user, you need to use something that is small and slight. Depending on your HR department, you may get away with being able to bang a newspaper on the table. Uh, some HR departments allow it, others do not. Find out from them first. They are quite the ones to use it already. Um, if they will not allow it, you need to find other things. A quiet yell. <clears throat> Down. Um, Staring them in the face, that works really well. You keep them, eyes on them, and eventually if they know they've done bad, they'll look down to the corner. It works. Um, again, as I said earlier, cattle prods and tasers are not as effective as they sound. Neither is mace. Um, I have seen people who have hit users that is a career-limiting move. 
Um, the other reason is, is once you've hit the user and they're not unconscious, you've wiped out their short-term memory. They wake up, they do the same thing over again because they've forgotten what had happened. Now, you can hit them over and over again, but it's not going to help any. Now, this is all sounding fun and games, but there are actually examples of how this works in real life. Um, early in my career, I had a very bad user. Uh, I was working at, a uni at uh, Los Alamos, and I had a postdoc who reminded me my first day that I only had a bachelor's, and therefore I worked for him and him alone because he, was, he had two postdocs and the rest of these people were just graduate students. And he would come and call me at two o'clock in the morning for things like fill the printer paper, make some coffee, uh, the internet is down. And this is 94, and the reason was is that he'd unplugged the coax cable to his thing and not plugged it in correctly. And I'd go in and all this. Um, I was getting really ready for the 2 by 4 and my boss at that time, who had been in the business for a lot longer, he'd been in it since the 60s, gave me a very important lesson. Uh, I was a contractor, and I hadn't been properly billing these hours. So he had me go through a formal step. I told everyone in the organization how to do these jobs, how to make the coffee, how to um, fill up the printer paper, how to reconnect cables properly, how to check if the cables were in by looking at the lights on the back of your computer. Had nice little write-ups, I printed it out, had nice little printouts everywhere these had to be done. I also had a little thing of what it cost to call me in. Um, and if you called in, you had to send an email to this site. Otherwise, I could not start on a job after hours. I was only there for eight or five. I was on an emergency call otherwise. Um, this didn't stop the, 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 the postdoc. He called me in two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. I was. Luckily, I lived across the street from where I was working, so I just walked across in my pajamas with a robe on, fixed whatever it was, and went back. Um, all the hours were put in properly, and it came for my paycheck, and because it had been Memorial Day weekend, and I got paid, if it was after hours, I got four times pay, if it was on a weekend, it was an additional two times. And if it was on a holiday, I got an additional two times. I earned 296 hours of overtime in a two-week period. That, was, that cost his postdoc account $26,000, which basically wiped him out for the whole quarter, and he had to go back to the university. <laughs> um, now, the important lesson here was I got called into the manager and he asks me, why, how can you put in 296 hours? And I, I brought in all the reams of stuff my boss had told me to bring in, which was all the emails saying why these things were important and all the stuff that I had done. And it got approved. And like I said, the postdoc had to go. Actually, it took him one more two-week period. And then his account was completely wiped out and they sent it back to the university. But it paid off my student loans, so I was very happy. Um, the, th the other thing it turned out was, by doing all these little things, even to the coffee maker, I had fulfilled my ISO 9000 requirements for that quarter. I hadn't even known I had ISO 9000 requirements, but I did. I had to label all this stuff. I had to write down documents and procedures. I got a bonus. <laughs> um, now, I th thought this was supposed to be training the user in this, but it turned out it wasn't training the user. It trains the manager. And my, bo my boss, because this is a government thing, you have managers, you have bosses, and they're two completely two different people. 
The boss tells you what to do and how to do it. The manager just signs the check and then yells at you when you go over things. Um, he came in and said, um, showed me that you know my manager only looks at my things every two weeks to sign the checks. Otherwise, he doesn't care I exist as long as he's not being yelled at by the users. So he wasn't being yelled at by the users. The users loved me. They had finally somebody who, they actually felt empowered that they could turn on their Mac boxes and move their Mac boxes around on the thin net without the whole network going down because no one had shown them that they weren't supposed to unplug the two clips on the back. They could just twist the little thing and pull it off. So they were, all during the day, they were unplugging things, pulling things apart, moving their Mac around to another part to, to work with somebody else. And then I'd have to come around and bring be the connectors back in, tie it back in, because everybody else was yelling at me, the network's down, oh God. And I also showed them how to set up the backup client. So that instead, what they had been doing to back up all their stuff every day was they were emailing themselves because they knew the email servers were always backed up. And they had a little IMAP client and whatever Macintosh was or a pop thing or whatever. This is back in 94, 95. And they were taking everything on their desktop and they had a folder and they would put it in the folder and it would save it all as emails on the email server, which was 10 miles away on a T1 link. And it would just sit there and everything would bind down at four o'clock because it's a thin net wire and there's no, it's all collisions. So I showed them how instead that if you set this little thing up, you press the little button that was already on there and put it in a time, at three o'clock in the morning it would back up their systems and they, could, they wouldn't have all these problems. And I had a little diagram for them because I, I realized that and I put most of the diagrams by the two things that are most important to a user's life. The coffee machine and the toilet. Um, usually they're near each other. But you put, I put one set there and I put another set in the toilets. So that when they went in, they could read the stuff while they were concentrating on other things. And they could learn how to do their job without asking me to do it. Because while we're sysadmins and we have other things in our lives, we spend most of our times on interrupts, dealing with little tiny things. Well, they're tiny to us, but they're not tiny to the people we're dealing with. They're usually big crises because they have other drivers, like that deadline and all that. I am supposed to be, you know, building a whole new mail system for them that's not 10 miles away, but local. And it's not working because I'm spending all my entire time going, oh my God, the printer's out of paper again. Because being scientists, they would write everything on the computer in a nice thing. They would then print it out and then overline and word edit all their stuff and find all the spelling mistakes, then go back and type it back into the computer again. I decided the word processing was outside of my scope for training. Um, so I let that for the next guy. Um, another good example, or hopefully a good example. Um, at another job site, um, we had a huge amount of compromised machines. We would compromise, we would go in, the network, they'd talk about how slow their computers were and how nothing was working and the mouse was moving by itself at times and stuff like that. And I went in, we'd clean it up, we'd go through with the, the hazmat team, clean out all the systems, set them all up, and then a week later, actually a day later or so, they'd all be bad again. Um, basically, it got really bad at one point where somebody got an email asking them to reset their password. And so they happily sent their old password to the administrator 
at some place that wasn't our place because they said that in the email, blah, 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 has contracted out their support to us and your passwords have been lost and we need to reset them. Um, and we had a whole bunch of boxes that were not up to date and all that kind of stuff because it broke their various business applications. If you updated stuff, Oracle wouldn't work. If you fixed it, Oracle wouldn't work. If you got Oracle to fix it, then the other business app that relied on Oracle wouldn't work. Um, so we got it all cleaned up. We cleaned out the backups because basically what had happened is we'd overtrained our users in backing up stuff. And they would restore from backup after we cleaned up everything. And they'd already backed up all their, back, their worms and viruses and compromised stuff and run them again because they wanted the little happy cat that danced across the screen. We trained them not to do that in a slow, methodical method. Again, using similar methods, we broke it down to tasks, you know, how to recognize bad email, how to ask us questions properly if this email is work. And basically, and again, we use the same slow, quiet tone with them. It was a, I, I'd, I'd mellowed a lot by this time. Um, and then, after about a month, we sent them out bad emails from an off-site place. Um, basically, we sent out some spams and stuff like that. And if they clicked on the link, it brought up a page asking them to get re-educated and recorded who had done it. So they couldn't say, oh, you didn't do it. I um, the people who sent us questions and said, I got this email. Did you guys contract out to a uh, website to do our uh, technical support? And I said, we'd give them a treat. We gave them a USB keys, I think. Uh, which reminds me, I got USB keys for later. Um, we, the ones who didn't tell us but we knew hadn't clicked on anything, we, we gave them a reward of a different thing. We upped their quota a bit and told them that Thank you for uh, following advice here. You People who didn't and had gotten retrained had to go through a, uh, basically they got called down to the office and talked to very slowly and clearly that clicking on things damaged their work prospects in the long run because it could cause significant damage to where we were working and we weren't in a happy mood about that. And we didn't do it ourselves. We actually had physical security do this. That works much better than a book. Because these guys do look like they just came out of prison. And they can talk that lingo and remind them that certain aspects of what they do could send you to the place they just came out of. But uh, so we spent this whole time doing this, and we found various correlations. We found out the people who clicked on things were the same people who complained that password changing wasn't a useful skill. Um, we found that certain users who we knew, we, we actually located some of our most troublesome users and put them on a separate network, just because it was easier in the long run to keep them in a clean, pristine environment that was completely their own, that we could wipe every day and put back in place. I've used ABA, and I've seen my boss, some of my best managers use ABA a lot. We don't call it that, and we don't use it as humorously, but I found it very useful in everything from training users to training myself. Because, face it, we are the worst users we have. If there's a machine that is not going to be backed up or changed because the fact is, is we're worried that it will go down, it's our own laptop. Or we have multiple copies that we've kept all over the place 
and forgotten where we put it. Uh, we're very interrupt driven. So we rarely get anything done that we've told our bosses we're going to get done. And they don't like that. So I, myself involved, I took a time period where I broke down what I was needing to do every day. I gave myself a small reward every time I completed it. And eventually after about a month, I actually was on time for once on getting my reports in and getting I also had figured out how long a project really was going to take me, so I didn't say I was going to do it. I just get it done when it was done and not put it on my annual review because those things count, it seems. Um, my reward system is I usually give myself 10 minutes of fuzzy cats online, you know, one of those cute cat pictures or something, something nice and relaxing. Um, Something with, you know, or a comic, you know, Dilbert or something. If it's Friday, I read The Bastard Operator from Hell on Register. But um, I, I found that if I stuck to one bad habit and I worked it, I could work it out pretty well. I've had some backsliding, but it's worked pretty well. Um, the best person who taught me these things was my boss at my former job before I worked at Fedora. He was a hypnotist. That was it, been his entire career before this. And he was the best damn manager I have ever met. You would go into a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, you were utterly convinced you could do this. I showed up on time. I'm working at a university in a basement under the sewage system. I was there every day, happy. And as he said, he didn't like people. In fact, he hated people. But he loved dogs. And as long as he treated people like dogs, he got, a, he got along well. And it was funny, it worked. I saw him convince over a month our worst user our absolutely worst user to retire two years early because he absolutely, you know, just calmly looking him in the eyes, talking in a nice, soft, monotone voice that sounds just like off the radio, clearly and succinctly in a nice, almost heartbeat rhythm. And eventually, the user realized that nothing was going to ever change the way they wanted it, that everything that they wanted to do was outside of the workplace, and that they needed to go there soon. And they did. And they were so happy afterwards. Everything that they hated about the university, not a problem anymore. I'm not there. They actually came back as a contractor, as a happy person. We got, they were no longer a troubled user because all the things that they'd held against the university was no longer a problem because they were a contractor. They can walk out the door, they can walk in the door, they can walk out the door, they can walk in the door. But the main thing though was if you are a sysadmin, become a hypnotist. Take a couple courses in it, learn how to stare them in the eye, and just talk in a nice rhythm. And you have to figure out the, each user's rhythm. It's one thing he told me, because their heart rates are different. And you have to get the, <laughs> but you have to get it down to their heart rate and calm them down and make their brains clear. And once you've done that, you can get so far along. And it, eventually, as I was looking at this, he was, in how he did this, part of the hypnotism was he was using um, ABA and Skinner tests. He broke everything down. He gave you a reward if you did it right. He gave you a big reward and a big, if you did it right fast, he gave you a smaller reward if it was something. But he always gave you a reward and he tapered it off over time. So that eventually, I was just happy to say, when he said, that's a good job. I'd be like, ah, God, great. And I, I know that he hypnotized me the whole time I was there. And that's why I liked him so much. 
but he's dead now, so I can say that with a whole thing about any stuff. But he was... Uh, it, it showed me quite clearly the, how to win against your users in that breaking things down for them and talking in a way that is not menacing to them works much better than the normal way of doing things. Although it's fun, it doesn't get you, at the end of the day, any further. And eventually you get tired of beating them. I, I think I'm about done. I have time for questions. Um, I do have a warning. There is a group in most of your companies that already know all this, and they do it to you all the time. And you need to avoid them. Marketing, if it's a good marketing group, uses this on you and everyone they know all the time. The marketing at one place I worked at, I was overwhelmed. I couldn't get every, anything done. I had 40 requests every morning to put up new web pages, clean out stuff, change links, all this stuff. And my manager was useless. He said, they're all important. Get them done. Figure it out yourself. So I did. I put up a sign saying, orders will be done by amount of donuts. And funny enough, marketing has budget. <laughs> and they gave me donuts. <laughs> a dozen Krispy Kremes every morning. I got it done. They are, their jobs were done. They didn't have Krispy Kremes that morning. They would mix it up. I got a half dozen Bojangle biscuits. Or, uh, what was the other one they had for me? One time they took me out to dinner. It wasn't great. I mean, it was just down, down the street to the Waffle House. But, you know, for a sysadmin, it's 8, 9 p.m. o'clock at night. You know, a cheap T-bone steak is as good as anything. And then the other groups started learning this, and I, it just got worse and worse to the point where I was at 239 pounds and my cholesterol was even higher. It was somewhere in the 300s and my triglycerides were... One test I had to take over because it wrapped over. <laughs> it was bad and my wife was really worried and my... Doctor said that if I whatever I was doing, stop it now because I'd be dead soon. Um, and I learned a horrible lesson. I left the job, and marketing just started training the next guy. He got a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts every day. He got the same jobs done. He left a year and a half later for the same reason. Um, but it was the same thing. They, they, they learned rewards work really well, and slight punishments, if you don't do it right, work the same. Um, do you guys have any questions? I have, I have filled my quantity of 50, 45 minutes. Uh, some of you are awake still. Uh, lunch will be served somewhere. <laughs> they never told me. Um, let's see. I got this. I apologize for the roughness of this. This is my first talk I've done in oh, sorry, years. Um, and uh, I got it done at around what? <laughs> my dad kicked me out of the house last night. Uh, I was working on it still. Um, I, this was humorous. I, I'm probably overly humorous. This actually does work better than our usual methods. And I can't overemphasize over for certain job places that are under an ISO 9000 or an ITIL. Filling out these things can actually get you bonuses because no one else will do it. And if you have things where you have labeled out, and it may seem stupid, I, I didn't believe I was going to get a bonus for doing one for coffee.
what I did. Because, as they put it, people were th- putting in three or four of those things at once into the bags, and it was spilling all over, and they have to get the cleaning group in. And it was costing them a lot of money and wasted coffee. Nobody wants that. Um, but otherwise, any questions? No. Hello? Whichever you like more. <laughs> um, most of my reading actually has been an intro to psychology course and a sociology course. Um, most of your college level ones will have it. They go over the main, main stuff. The s- hypnotism is usually better to be done by an expert versus something that you can read. A lot of places have colleges. You need to investigate them. Um, the reason being is you can read it and do it wrong, or you can get um, you can read it and never do it right. Um, and you also have to be able to be a person who can do it. Now, if you are a nice, if you're able to stare at a computer screen for hours and find that one little comma that's off, you can do it is how my boss said it. Because you have the concentration to do it. It's basically a sync of syncophizing. But he said no reading. Um, most of the psychology, I've picked up a lot of pop psychology, but I think the best one I got out of books was my experiment, was just a uh, Psych 101 course. Um, if you really want to know more about the breaking down and better than what I put in, ABA, which is what this is called, um, is what you, if, if you know anyone with children with autism, it's a method that's used to teach children with autism. Um, and there, it has a better hu- humanistic side of things than, it's also how you train, a, I mean, in many ways, it's most what of most obedient schools are. But the same thing with an autistic child is an autistic child does not have the brain paths to do certain stuff. And until they have done it through a hand over hand situation and you've broken it down in small enough parts, and um, they're basically you have to prompt them. And if you go to a, a lot of, a, do it, even a, look in your area, look for an ABA training thing for autistic, autistic or for parents. There's tons of them because it's a, it's a method that works really great with autistics. And to a lesser degree, it works with humans. Um, not humans. <laughs> as an auti- as, I'm an autistic person, so I'm, 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 that was supposed to be self-deferential humor, and then I realized that it doesn't come across that way to other people. Um, it works with users to, to a lesser degree because they are they may pick up things differently. But I, there's lots of material on this, and I found it to be uh, generally useful in stuff. Um, Here. And basically, I mean, it, there's lots of books that you'll read. Most of them are the same thing over and over again. Oh, but that's it. I'm sorry I couldn't get it any bigger. For some reason, this thing's all wacky. Um, but once, this, once you've done that, you've pretty much picked up the general stuff. Um, anything else? Yes, sir? I like a Kenyan Pete's blend. No. 
but it's a um, it's a blend that's dried out on um, leaves that are in Kenya, and it gets a fruity flavor to it, like a blackberry. Just a little hint of it. It depends on the year. Kenyan. I like it from peats, uh, P-E-E-T-S, but you can get Kenyan from various other things, and depending on the year and the time. Uh, and then it's a matter of how much you like it roasted, and that's, um, tastes are very finicky about that. Anything else? I'm down to lanyards. Yes. Yeah. I, I, and it it also works on the same thing of the same basic stuff. You break it down and you give them a nice little happy face reward of some sort. I, I, I'm not familiar with that one exactly, but I've seen one that will have a little, little tiny. It's like the if you go to the OLPC desk over by the fedora and you see the little OLPC and they have the little guy that talks. You can type in words, and he has a little. He, he can you can get him to smile. And honestly, this little thing that'll talk and say, good job, works great for users. I don't want to overestimate, but they'll be fascinated by it, and they'll go, ooh, <laughs> I feel the toner in right. <laughs> um, again, most of these things, I tried to pick things that a lot, some of us would deal with. If you're dealing with remote users and stuff, you need to find different reward systems. I find that mailing them something is really good because they never get anything. And if you can give them a postcard, it's, it's not an immediate reward, which is a downside, but it does work. You, know, you send them a postcard from the office and say, I'm really glad you filled out the paperwork on time. Good job. And you'll get they'll, they'll they'll fill it out properly from then on. Well, maybe a couple more cards. Yeah. Um, I think it's time for lunch. I think he's here to kick me off the stage. Oh, you have, uh, seven more minutes. I'm done. I I stretch. <laughs> I'm shaking so much up here, I, I'm done. <laughs> well, how do you do? Hey, hey. <laughs> Thank you. Your money will be in the mail soon. <laughs>
And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.